Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in BST. In this episode, we're covering the coming week from the 21st to the 27th of October. I'm Ezzy Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined on the podcast today by astronomer Mary McIntyre. Hello, Mary. Hi, Ezzy. It's great to be back. So what do we have to look forward to in this week's night sky? We have lots of bright planets on show, some lovely lunar conjunctions. We hope we still have a nice comet and so a couple of meteor showers and a deceased fly to look out for. I'm intrigued by that last one. <laughs> <laughs> the clocks are going back at two o'clock in the morning on the 27th of October. So that's Saturday this week. So the times of the planets rising and setting are going to be one hour earlier on Sunday because we're moving from British summer time back to Greenwich mean time or universal mm -hmm. time. So yeah, just be aware that the times are going to be different on Sunday because of the clock change. So first of all, Venus is still moving through Scorpius. It's setting at about 7, 10 p.m. And that is about an hour and 15 minutes after the sun. So while technically it's very bright at mag minus 3.8, it is going to still be severely affected by twilight glow. So you may get a glimpse of it, but it's not going to look as blazing as it will do in the coming weeks when it gets a bit higher. Saturn is in Aquarius and that will be visible as soon as it gets dark, about 19 degrees above the southeast horizon and that will remain visible until 3.10 in the morning. On the 21st to the 24th of October, it's going to lie really close to the Mag plus 6.8 star, which you can see below Saturn in binoculars. So when you look at Saturn, you will notice that there's a, a star nearby. That is not one of Saturn's moons. It is a star. So just look out for that with binoculars. We have a double shadow transit of Saturn on the 27th of October with the moons Dione and Rhea. So the Dione shadow transit starts at 5 past 10 p.m. And then Rhea will start at 10.33 p.m. So there will be a brief moment there where you've got two shadows visible on the disk of Saturn. That will finish at around 2 a.m. UT. So yeah, just bear in mind that overnight that night, the time is going to switch halfway through the night. So when you look at the times of those shadow transits, bear in mind they begin in BST and end in UT. So I'm sure that's not going to cause any amount of confusion for people at all. Neptune is to the left of Saturn in the evening sky. It's actually lying just below the constellation of Pisces. It's about 18 degrees above the east-southeast as it gets dark. And then through the night, it moves towards the upper left of Saturn and sets about an hour and 20 minutes after Saturn does. So it's still around mag plus 7.8. So you will need binoculars or a telescope to see it. And you can still see Triton orbiting the planet if you have a, a larger telescope or imaging set up. That is around mag plus 13.4. So that's within reach of a lot of imaging rigs. So that's definitely one to look out for. You'll see it orbiting in a clockwise direction through the night. So it's always fun to see celestial clockwork mechanics at work. Jupiter lies in Taurus this week and is continuing to put on a great show, a very bright Mag minus 2.3. It's rising at about 8.15 p.m. and remains visible all night. And the star N Tauri is still very close um, below Jupiter. Overnight on the 26th and 27th at 11.30 BST, Ganymede is doing a shadow transit of Jupiter, but there will be others throughout the week to look out for. We don't have time to list all of them, but that will be a particularly nice one. Mars is in Gemini this week, rising in the northeast at around 10.35 p.m. And it's going to remain visible all night long and at around mag plus 0.4. It's definitely visible with the naked eye and look for its distinctive red colour, which usually is a giveaway that it's Mars. 
Uranus is currently about 6.75 degrees to the lower right of the Pleiades. So that is rising at about 6.35 p.m. in the east-northeast. Then it remains visible all night long. Uranus is brighter than Neptune, but at Mag plus 5.7, you will still need binoculars to see it. And Pluto is very soon going to start to be lost in the twilight. So it's currently at Mag plus 14.5. It gets to its highest point in the south at around 7 p.m. when it's 15 degrees above the southern horizon and it's going to set at about 10.45 p.m. So try to grab your chance to see that while we still can because very soon we're going to lose Pluto. Mercury is lost in the evening twilight still this week so that will be a very difficult one to spot. Okay, moving on to the moon. The moon is moving from a waning gibbous down to a waning crescent this week with a last quarter moon on the 24th of October. The day before that, on the 23rd of October, just before sunrise, you will see Mars about 9.3 degrees to the lower left of the moon, while Jupiter will be nearly 26 degrees to the right. So you'll have both planets either side of the moon before dawn, I should say. At 11 p.m. that night, the moon is going to rise with Mars just 3.3 degrees to the lower right of it, and Jupiter will be 36 degrees to the upper right. So the planet's kind of changing their relative positions with the moon, but Mars is going to be super close to the moon that night. We have the last quarter moon on the 24th of October, and at 1 a.m., that is now going to be 3.8 degrees to the left of Mars. So Mars and the moon are going to be fairly close together for three nights that week. We still have the Orionids meteor shower active. Uh, it's uh, technically active from the 14th to the 31st of October, but the peak is generally around the 20th to the 23rd. So we start this week at the peak of that shower. So this is debris from Comet 1P Halley. The Zenith hourly rate is only around 25. So visual rate for that is about eight to nine, something around that number. But we're gonna be affected by the gibbous moon. So you may see fewer than that. The radiant doesn't rise till 10 p.m. Rates do pick up this week, but it's best before dawn. And unfortunately, we've got a waning moon, so the moon is going to interfere. But Orion mm. is a very fast moving meteor at 67 kilometers per second. So you should still see the brighter ones, though, even with the moon around. And meteor showers are always best observed before dawn. I think that might be one if you are out and about anyway, if you're looking at the moon if you're you know trying to look at it as it's near to mars and to jupiter then perhaps just keep an eye out if you see one of these happening about or you're waiting for your photograph to take or whatever just keep an eye out for some orionids and see if you can see any yeah the other night every time i stuck my head out the door i saw a meteor so you know you just don't know yeah. when they're gonna happen it was genuinely every time i looked up i saw one that night and there was no particular shower happening it just there's a lot of space debris up there and we do get a lot of just background noise as well there's two other meteor showers that are active at the moment although not very good rates and that's the northern and southern torrids both of those are debris from comet 2p enk but they've split apart into two very distinct debris fields that don't even lie in taurus anymore they've drifted away from the constellation yeah they are both active but the northern torrids is going to peak at the round about the middle of November but the rates are going to be low now but they will pick up as we go through this month so I think we said last week and the week before but the torrids are interesting because sometimes you get a rate enhancement due to the torrid meteor storm the swarms there's just so much kind of little pockets of debris of, within that meteor stream and you just never know when we're going to hit a pocket of that and have some slightly bigger chunks of debris so it's a really interesting shower to observe and even if you don't see very much it's kind of valuable to know that because we can kind of model where the debris stream is and how it's moving so it's always an interesting one you may well get surprised and see some good stuff there so again another one to just keep an eye out for while you're out and about comet 2023 A3 Susan Chan Atlas is going to be moving through Ophiuchus this week and has been putting on a good show. The Naked Eye Comet last week and the week before. This week it's going to be climbing higher in the sky, but as it's getting further from the sun, it's going to fade a little bit. So it probably will have faded to be a binocular object, but we really don't know at this point. It may still have a very long tail that will be visible with binoculars, but by the end of this week, it's going to lie below 
YC4665, the summer beehive cluster, which is a beautiful cluster, does look very remarkably similar to the beehive cluster in Cancer. Mm. It's a really nice cluster. I've, I've sketched it before now through binoculars. It's really pretty. So having the comet near there will be really nice, but it may be a binocular object by now. Yes. As we said a couple of weeks ago in an episode We have to record these a little bit ahead of time, which makes comets a bit tricky because comets, you just have to wait and see what happens as they go through the night sky. So if you want to really keep up to date with everything that's going on with Susan Shan Atlas, I suggest you go to our website, skyatnightmagazine.com, where we have a guide that we're constantly updating with the latest that's happening with that comet. I'll put a link in the show notes below as well so you can look at that there. So on to the deceased fly. This is a defunct constellation called Musca Borealis, and it's got a really interesting history. Not all constellations were named during Greek times. There were some more modern ones where things were added to kind of break the sky up into manageable chunks. The Greeks tended to name the brighter ones, but there are lots of other areas of sky that needed to be assigned a name. So there was a bit of the kind of back and forth going on with some of the constellations. And this is an old one. It was four naked eye stars that formed a kind of triangle shape. And the brightest star was Barani. And in 1674, it was called a bee. So they named that triangular shape was a bee. I'm always fascinated by what people interpret the shapes as. It's different for every person. So after it was a B in 1674, it then became a fleur-de-lis symbol that you often mm-hmm. see on royal crests. I can see how you get from one of those to the other, just about. <laughs> yep, just about. 1687, Johann Hevelius decided to name it Musca the Fly. There was already a constellation called the Fly in the Southern Hemisphere, so it was Musca Borealis, Borealis being northern. Mm -hmm. But then because there was another one, they eventually zapped that fly and gave the stars back to the constellation of Aries, where they were stolen from in the first place. (laughs) But it is still a really nice asterism. If you look at it through binoculars, you do have that star shape, but there are other stars visible there. You'll see lots of different contrasting star colours within that little cluster, and there are some faint to star chains. I'm always really fascinated when you point your binoculars at somewhere, the number of apparently straight chains of stars that you see in all directions. And it is just a line of sight thing, but those kind of faint star chains are always really fun to look at. So there's Mm -hmm. loads of those within Musca Borealis, so definitely worth seeking out with binoculars. It's definitely some sort of political thing going on with the names of the flies there by the sound of it, Um, by the name of the the, the stars and the constellations of it's getting moved around all over the place and then in the end they just go like nah it's just in Aries let's just put it back there (laughs) (laughs) it's kind of funny isn't it there are there are so many constellations that that's happened to yeah because you do occasionally we get a story about the IAU has said that's the International Astronomers Union they are the people who decide what the stars are officially called and asteroid names and things like that and occasionally there's a bit of, you know, controversy about where exactly one thing is or another. The most famous example of that was, you know, Pluto getting demoted to being a dwarf planet as they change all of these definitions of things that have stood for thousands of years. The fury people still carry over that is, it doesn't matter what its <laughs> official title is, it's still a, a lovely dwarf planet to try to observe. So I always say it might have the word dwarf in front of it, but it's still a planet. <laughs> a dwarf planet is still a planet. Exactly. Um, Finally, the International Space Station is going to return to the pre-dawn sky this week. So if you are an avid ISS spotter, then pre-dawn this week is your time to have a look for that. So that's everything for this week. Well, thank you very much for taking us through all of that, Mary. And if our listeners want to keep up to date with all of the latest goings on in the night sky, please do subscribe to the Star Diary podcast. But to summarise this week again... All of the planets, except for Mercury, are going to be on show this week, though it is beginning to get tricky to see Venus as it gets lost in the twilight. Particular highlights are a double shadow transit on Saturn on the 27th of October and a Ganymede shadow transit across Jupiter on the 26th to the 27th of October. The moon moves from being a waning gibbous to a crescent this week, with last quarter on the 24th of October. On the 23rd of October, Mars and the Moon will be close together with Jupiter nearby as well. 
The Orionids continue to peak early this week and the northern and southern taurids will also be ongoing as well. Neither of them are particularly prolific meteor showers, but if you are out and about, keep an eye out for those. Comet Susan Shan Atlas should hopefully still be visible throughout this week. It may still have a long tail and be on the border between naked eye visible and binoculars. We'll have to wait and see. It's also a great opportunity to take a look at Musca Borealis, the dead fly asterism, which is now part of Aries, and the ISS returns to the pre-dawn sky. And as well, don't forget that in the UK, the clocks will be changing on the morning of the 27th of October. So if you are making any observations on that night, just double check your times to make sure that you don't miss anything that's happening. That's all from us this week, and hopefully we'll see you back next week. Goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Mm-hmm.